First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. I am Pastor Sue Collar. Thank you for being with us here today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please text hello to the number on the screen. And if you are joining us for our worship watch party, please say hi in the comments. It's one of the ways we build community by worshiping together. If you would like to download a bulletin for today's service, you can do that from our website, fpclincoln.org. A couple of announcements for you today. We have two very special events coming up this week. On Tuesday, October 27th, we have a special Zoom panel about how to have meaningful conversations on divisive issues. Uh, in our world where we are almost afraid to bring up some topics with family or even friends, we need to learn skills about how to have those conversations in healthy ways and in ways that reflect who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. So join us on Tuesday evening for a panel discussion about that, and we're going to have some opportunities after that if you'd like to go deeper into learning ways to have these conversations. And then on Friday, October 30th, is our annual Sing from the Heart concert. And this year we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. The charity we are supporting this year is Civic Nebraska. And as you might guess, our concert this year is online. Unfortunately, we still cannot gather in person, but we felt this was an important enough concert and message that we still wanted to do it this year. So I hope you will join us on Friday the 30th for our Sing from the Heart concert. You can find all the information about how to connect with that, either scrolling on the screen during the prelude or on our website. Friends, let us worship God. Today we are privileged to have Reverend Landon Whitsitt as our guest preacher today. Landon is the Synod Executive of the Synod of Mid-America, which is a few states south of us, and he is also a former vice moderator of our Presbyterian Church USA denomination. And so we are grateful that he is joining us today via video to bring us today's message. He's going to be lifting up Jesus' answer to the question, what is the greatest commandment? And part of the answer to that question is to love God with everything that you are. And so as we gather for worship today, let us do just that and bring all that we are to worship and love God with our, with our actions, with our voices, with our intellect, with all that we are. We begin with prayer, which is both praise to God and an invitation to worship. Let's pray. Living presence of God, whose presence inspires and consoles, 
You continue your promise from generation to generation. With the dawning light of day, you awaken creation to a wonders that await. As the sun sets, you pause on the mountaintop to offer a vision of what lies ahead. As we gather for worship today, may your living presence in creation continue to inspire us that we might live in the promise of God and mark our lives with a love that reaches beyond emotion. For your love asks for activity in worship and service. So in that spirit, may our worship today be a sign of our love for you, even as your presence, felt or unfelt, seen or unseen, is a sign of your love for us. Amen. Sing a new song unto the Lord, let your song be sung from mountains high. Sing a new song unto the Lord, singing hallelujah. Shout with gladness, dance for joy, O oh, come. Our scripture today talks about loving God and neighbor. I wish I could say that everything I've ever done or thought reflects love for God and neighbor, but I think that would be disingenuous of me. I doubt, though, that I am the only one who is not absolutely pure in thought and action. I bet I'm not the only one who at times has valued other things even other people, is higher than God. So as Chris leads us in prayer, I invite you to consider how it echoes in your life, how it connects with your understanding of yourself. And let me add, your confession will not be a surprise to God, for God knows us better than we know ourselves and yet loves us still. So let us be honest with ourselves and with God as we come before God in confession. Let us pray. Jesus told us to love God with all our heart, but we often love our jobs, our homes, and our possessions more than we love God. Jesus told us to love God with all our soul, but we put more soul into our music, our sports, and our hobbies than into expressing our love of God. Jesus told us to love God with all our mind, but we seldom study the Bible as much as we study our school books or our bank books. Jesus also told us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but we spend hours meeting our wants and needs and minutes finding excuses for not taking care of others. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to remember and obey your commands. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, believe again the gospel, the good news, that we are loved and accepted just as we are. Believe that we are forgiven, loved by God, even when we don't love ourselves well. Believe that we are the church, the holy body of Christ, called to love one another and the world as God in Christ loves us. May we share that forgiveness and that good news with others. Most glorious, the ancient. 
Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's probably one of the best known sections of the Gospel when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? It is a guiding question for all followers of Jesus, but it is also a very challenging one because once you know the answer, you can't plead ignorance. So listen together for the Word of God for us today from Matthew 22. Friends, thank you again for allowing us to be with you in worship today. As we head into the depth of autumn, I pray that you are staying safe and that pandemic fatigue hasn't affected you too severely. We're heading towards a crucial time in the life of this virus, but we know that Presbyterians are dedicated and resilient people, and we're honored to be just a small part of you keeping your communities safe. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we are not separate from you nor from one another, even though we often act like it. In your forgiving grace, please prick our hearts and illumine our minds so that we might hear a word from you this day. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel. Let's attend to God's word. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to him, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. And may God bless our reading and our hearing and our understanding of these words for how we live our lives. Amen. Here's what we forget. Jesus was not saying anything new. He he wasn't. I, I don't know if you're like me, but as a Christian, I've fallen into the trap over the years of thinking that while other people of faith are absolutely loved by God and that God uses all sorts of religious traditions to connect with people, we Jesus people have a leg up in a few ways, right? <laughs> have, you, have you ever thought that? I mean, of course, it's natural, right? For me, at least. I, I know Christianity inside and out. I'm a professional Christian, for God's sake. Literally, for God's sake. And, and so it would make sense that I kind of like this thing that we've got going, and I would think it's pretty special, right? And it is. But if we're not careful... We, okay, I, can easily fall into the trap of thinking that we Christians have got the corner on the market of goodness and beauty and truth. And today's passage is one of those places where I often have gotten stuck because, like I said, Jesus wasn't saying anything new. This bit of his about loving God and loving others, (laughs) that's classically Jewish. Classically Jewish. Rabbis had been saying it literally for years and so when we read in our passage for today from Matthew about some, ra- uh, about some Pharisees coming to test Jesus, test here doesn't mean gotcha. They weren't trying to trip him up. They were literally testing the new kid on the block to see if he knows his stuff, right? Is he even worth engaging? Does he know the most basic thing that a rabbi should know and teach, Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment in all of Torah, they ask, and Jesus isn't even phased because he knows it. Love God, love others. Easy. Done. Next. We Christians like to tell ourselves the story that Jesus came to make religion and a relationship with God easy. I grew up hearing that Jews were overly legalistic. Did you, did you grow up learning that as well? It's not entirely true, and you can imagine my shock when I discovered that. For the Jews of Jesus' day, not to mention our current 
siblings, the Jews of today, righteousness wasn't actually all that complicated. Yeah, the rabbis argued a lot. Christians theologians argue a lot, though, right? So they argued, but those basic arguments were all about the wide variety of ways that a person could fulfill these two commandments given to every Jew. Love God, love others. And Jesus says, and and remember, he's not the first person to say this. Jesus says, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two things. Everything else, everything else is in service of trying to help us love God more fully and love others more completely. And so it's, it's fun to imagine that Jesus was saying something radical, but, but it wasn't. It was actually quite basic and it was quite standard. It was these basic standard things that Martin Luther was trying to remind us of as well when on October 31st, 1517, he nailed a theological statement to a church door in Germany. We commemorate this act every year on this day, this Reformation Sunday, as a way of reminding ourselves that the theological movement we are a part of is one that seeks to always remind us that our obligations to God and to one another are actually not complicated. Luther believed that the church of his day had strayed far from the basic calling of God. You, you've heard the details of the Reformation before and his, his protest about it, about the indulgences and, and all that. But we should never forget that the main theme that came from the Reformation had to do with God's sovereignty and God's sovereign grace. And this grace reminds us that there is nothing anywhere that can impede us from loving God and loving one another. In fact, we might say that the Reformation at its core is a religious tradition ultimately concerned with making it possible for us to better show love. We don't have to follow any strict rules. We don't have to adhere to church attendance. We don't have to believe anything other than Jesus is Lord. If something, anything gets in the way of loving God and loving others, we say we don't have to worry about it. Our only obligations are to love God and love others. But it's funny, isn't it, how we forget this in our day-to-day lives? We, we sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, limit our imaginations in ways that make us think that, that spirituality and our Christian faith stops at the walls of our hearts or at the walls of our churches. It's as if we say, we'll listen to the church when it comes to prayer, but when it comes to our daily life, our everyday living, we've got to get guidance from somewhere else. Back in the 40s, a group of Reformation pastors in Germany wrote a document that has become one of our denomination's official theological documents. It's called the Theological Declaration of Barman. And in it, these pastors remind us and the world that there is no corner of life where God is not in charge. All of life, friends, is under God's command. And so in all of life, in every activity, in every choice we make, we Christians have an obligation to try to figure out how we best love God and others. Hmm. I got to tell you, as I think about my own life, in light of this very basic, standard, non-radical thing that Jesus was saying, love God, love others, I actually have a lot of questions. (laughs) Let's start with the big one. What are my obligations in regards to the money that I earn? Right? Do I have to give some of it away? How much? To who? Right? Every activity of life, every sphere of life, God's in control. Should I, should I vote for more or less taxes? What kinds of things should I buy? Are there things that I shouldn't buy? Where should I live? Where, where the house that I live in, where should I live? Should I buy new clothes or should I try to buy used clothes? That may sound silly, but if every activity is under the purview of God and I'm supposed to be making all these choices with how best to love God and love others, even things like my clothes, same with a car. Should I be buying a new car or a used car? 
Do I send my kids to public school or to private school? Should I get a flu shot? Should I wear a mask in public? What kind of job should I get? Is it okay for me to order from Amazon or do I need to buy from local small businesses? Right? And and you can probably think of a dozen more questions that we need to ask. And so here's the hard truth about being a Reformation Christian, friends. The goal of loving God and loving others, it's very simple, but boy, it requires a lot of work, doesn't it? It requires diligence and it requires discipline. And and we will make wrong choices, right? In all of those questions and many, many more, we're going to make the wrong choice and we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to change. And oftentimes, at least in my life, we're going to have to apologize, But this is why, I think, as Presbyterians, as Reformation Christians, I think this is why we talk so much about grace. We're going to mess this up. And we shouldn't be surprised. In fact, we should expect it. And when we know better, we do better. I want to leave you today with a prayer from the great Christian saint Thomas Merton. As you seek to love God and love others as fully and as completely as you can, I encourage you to pray this prayer as often as possible. Here's what Merton said. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me, and I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I'm following your will doesn't mean I'm actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all I am doing. I hope I never do anything apart from that desire. And I know if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, even though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear. For you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Friends, may we be the people who seek with every fiber of our beings to please God, both in our relationship with God and with one another. Amen. Thanks be to God. Hi, everybody. Do you like my background for children's time, children's time, Halloween is coming, Halloween is coming. As I was thinking about what we were going to talk about today, friends, and I was putting up this background of these fun skeletons, it got me thinking about bones. Hmm. All right. Now, I've got some fun facts for you about bones. And I want to tell you that I got them from a book called Indescribable, 100 Devotions About God and Science. And I'll have um, Carrie in our office put this on our website. So if that's a book that you and your family want to pick up, my friend Jamie, hello Jamie, I'm thinking of you. Jamie is three and a half and she's in our church family. And she loaned this wonderful book to me. Well, in it, it talks about God. And science. And so here are some fun facts about bones. And you might try to really remember these. And if your mom and dad aren't sitting around you right now, or your grandma or grandpa come and see you, or or you FaceTime with them, you could see if you could impress them with these fun facts. Okay, number one, fun fact. Jellyfish do not have bones like we have all these bones. Number two, Did you know that the adult body has 206 bones? 206 bones. Put that in your brain. Fun fact number three. Half of those 206 bones are in the hands and the feet. So that's like over 103 bones are in our hands and our feet. Feet. Fun fact number four, your thigh bone. Remember your thighs are right here or it might be on your lap if you're sitting down. That's your longest bone and there's a little 
little tiny bone in your middle ear, and that is your smallest bone. Fun facts. Now, bones are very, very important to us. Bones keep us standing like this little skeleton guy that I have. The bones are going to keep him standing. And friends, bones keep you standing tall also. That's what keeps, it's our skeleton. It's what it what's allows us to stand up very tall. Bones make up your body shape. And like this skeleton here, it makes up the shape of it. But these aren't the only bones you need, these bones in your body. You also need some bones of faith. Hmm, does that sound kind of interesting? But you've never heard that at Halloween before. But how do we keep our bones of faith healthy? Because we know to keep the bones of our skeleton here healthy, we have to exercise, we have to eat healthy, and we have to get good sleep. In order to keep our bones of faith healthy, we need to, are you ready? Number one, we need to pray. We need to do lots of praying. Number two, we need to praise. We need to thank God for all the wonderful things he gives us and the way he takes care of us. Number three, we need to study God's word. That means get out our Bibles, read things in our Bibles, read Bible stories, or like this little devotional book that I just talked about. And number four, when we can, I know we can't right now in person be with our church family, but when we can be with each other in person, we need to do that to keep our faith bones strong. And when we can't do that, we need to do this. We need to watch children's time on the video. We need to go to our um, virtual Sunday school and do that to keep our faith bones healthy. Did you know that your faith bones are some of your most important bones that you need? to have a good life. So when you pray, praise, study, and get together with your church family, either virtual or when we can get together in person, that's going to help your faith bones say stay. Oh, that was a funny hard word to say. It was an S word there. Help your faith bones Stay healthy. So during Halloween, when you see a skeleton, somebody dressed up like a skeleton, or a skeleton hung somewhere, or you see skeletons on someone's house, I want you just kind of in your brain to go, oh, I like that skeleton. Oh, I don't want to forget. I have faith bones too. Okay, are you ready for our prayer? Here we go. I'm going to put my little skeleton down here, and I'm going to say it. You say it after me. Here we go. Lord, show me how to keep my bones of faith strong. Your turn. Lord, show me how to keep my bones of faith strong so I can always stand tall for you. So I can always stand tall for you. Amen. Boys and girls, again, I miss seeing you in person, but I love being with you this way. Have a safe Halloween, however you end up doing it, because it might feel different this year. But watch out for skeletons. And remember, your bones of faith. Pray, praise, study, join together. Love you all. Bye.
Our prayer today is a little more of a responsive prayer than we've typically done. It's a more formal style of prayer, but it's a wonderful style because it invites us to feel the rhythm of prayer. I will be lifting up various petitions throughout this prayer, and when I say, let us pray, you respond with, Lord, make us instruments of your love. I will be doing that several times throughout the prayer. So again, when I say, let us pray, you will say, Lord, make us instruments of your love. And if you've already forgotten what I said, it will be up on the screen for you to see as well. But let us begin by praying together. Lord, Lord make, make us, us instruments, instruments of, your, of love. your love. Generous God, May your love for us animate all we do, and may our love become contagious. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your love. May we, the church, the people of God, never cease to proclaim by its teaching, life, and liturgy that love of God and neighbor is the heart of the gospel and that people are God's gift to us. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your love. May people never lose their hearts in today's economic systems of profit, efficiency, production, and competition. Instead, may they keep giving first place to human relationships of friendship, respect, and care. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your love. May we have room in our hearts and homes for refugees and strangers. And may we learn to share our goods and ourselves with the people loved by God, the poor and the lonely and those who suffer. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your love. May those who don't know how to forgive, those who have not experienced much happiness in life, or whose longings have not been fulfilled, encounter a bit of God's goodness in our attention and care. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your love. In our Christian communities, we may uplift one another rather than tear down, accept each other with trust and affection, forgive one another from the heart, and go forward together in hope and love. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your love. Gentle God, help us to love you and one another with your measure, that is, without measure, in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray with boldness. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's been a while since we have given a servant spotlight here during our worship service, an opportunity to introduce you or help you to know better some of the servants in our church who are making a difference through their faith. Today, I want to introduce you to Nancy Field. Nancy has been a member of this church for a long time. We've all seen her around. She's been very involved in mission. And uh, today, we just have a chance to get to know her a little bit better. <music> you been here? Well, I joined the church in 78, so oh my I've goodness. been here a long time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so what, what made you come here? I mean, what made you visit here? What was, tell me that. I was here in Lincoln to go to UNL, and I, uh, actually my father and I moved here at the same time, and we were looking for a church, and this was in the neighborhood. Checked out a couple of other churches hmm. that are also in the same denomination, but this one was the one that was the most friendly, the most, uh, uh, welcoming. So then we um, joined the church in 78. Talk a little bit about why do you keep coming back and, and and why you just continue to make this your 
Church home and family. Well, I think I, I think that the people here were friendly. Um, I've kind of grown up and grown older with some of the folks here and their kids. In spite of the different kinds of pastorates, they've all had something that attracted me and kept me coming here. And it just felt like a small church and a big church. You mm. know, there was enough relationships that it really felt like a small church. So I hear what you're saying is relationships are huge and have yeah. been. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's important for people if they come, they're looking for a place to be safe and and kind of feel like they can get to know people and there can be a sense of community. So you have found that here for you over the years, right? Even to this day? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I think of some of the folks that maybe I didn't know as well when I first got here because I was a little bit younger and wasn't quite connected with them. But over the years, I've been in enough groups with people that now this is this is these are my friends. I have other folks, uh, co-workers and people I know through my job, but these have been a lot of social contacts for me and um, just long relationships, long-term mm -hmm. relationships. Yeah. What we're also talking about here is how has this church and this fellowship and this family of believers, um, how has it influenced your faith journey and your relationship with Jesus through the years and uh, what has that looked like? And talk talk through that a little bit. Well, I won't deny it. There were a couple of rocky periods where I wasn't real sure and kind of took a step back. Uh, I think that happens in everybody's faith journey. But I kept coming back. It just felt like I went to a couple of other churches. My parents ended up joining another church in town. But this one just still felt like home. This was still the people that I knew, the folks that I would have been growing older with. And... Uh, I'm so excited, this is terrible, but I'm so excited that this is now the church that I always wanted it to be. This is the church that says, no matter who you are, you're welcome here. No matter what your um, connections are in the world, um, there's a place for you here. So that's that's exciting to me, that everybody can be here. So, so I think that's obviously it. you're in outreach and mission. Yeah. So talk about that passion, why? Well, I think my dad was real active in um, mission work. And so I would just ride along, tag along when I was younger and got involved that way. Um, and then I kind of got the bug and got excited. Um, more as mission interpretation, I think, for the folks back in the pews, not necessarily. I haven't gone on some big mission trips, although I did go on a Presbyterian disaster assistance trip to uh, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. But um, for me, it's been more of the tell people what the church is doing and get them excited so that they will support and back the people that are doing God's work for us in the world. Because it kind of goes back to what you say, it's more, it's, it's in our neighborhood. This is the church that gets that, that we're here in this yeah. neighborhood yeah. and it's, we don't, the, the overseas stuff is important, but yeah. we're here, we have yeah. stuff going and, on. And I, I am more excited because of all the hands-on things we're doing now in the neighborhood. And I, I say now, the last 25 years, I've been helping over at the gathering place so on and off. So that's, you know, that's been a long-term thing. But but some of the other events, some of the other things that we do, um, I think we're getting a little more involved. And I can't, I don't think there are any taboo subjects anymore that we can't not talk about. We maybe won't get really involved in them, but we can at least help interpret and, and help educate. So I think that's exciting too. Well, as you can hear, Nancy has a passion for mission, and mission is something that's very important in the life of our congregation. We have several mission partners in our community that we team up with to make a difference, to make sure that people have health care, that they have food, that they have a place to go after school. Again, none of that would be possible without your help. So thank you for your gifts that allow us to make a difference for the people in our neighborhood and beyond. If you would like to continue to give to this effort or give for the first time, on the screen are several ways that you can do that. Or you can just go to our website and click the Donate button on the top of the page. And now as you go out from wherever you are out into the world, go out and love God in all that you say, all that you do, and love your neighbor as yourself. They go hand in hand, and when they do go hand in hand, people notice, and they begin to say, I want to be a part 
of what you're doing. So go out and love as only God can and as only you can. And I know you will, for you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the people of God. And God goes with you. Amen. Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org or find us on Facebook.